All right, this is um, an interesting patient. Um, it's a trauma patient. Let me just, um, I'll change the chronology, well, maybe just a little bit. So this is the first image in the trauma context, the 25th of June. Uh, 26th looks like that. And then going to the 27th, looks like that. And then, and I'll put this alongside, on the 28th, there's definitely new abnormality in the lungs in the afternoon and is intubated. That's new. So looking at the thumbnails here, you can see that he has a fracture of the femur. And what happened on the day of the 28th, a little bit earlier in the afternoon of the 28th is the placement of an intramedullary nail. So you enter the OR and they put in this rod in the femur just prior to this. So in looking at that, it's certainly consistent with, I'll try and make that big, lung edema. We don't see signs of interstitial lung edema, so it's certainly consistent with acute lung injury edema. And given the timing here, although it's a short period of time, I think, I think it's very likely that this is fat embolism. I know it's just a few hours, but I think sometimes putting in this rod and fat embolism has been described in the context of not just the fracture, but consequent on ORIF and intramedullary nailing of the fracture. So I think this is a form of acute lung injury edema in the afternoon. What is interesting also a little bit about this um, pattern of edema is that, and I hope you can see this, but this upper lobe here, perhaps here, but to my eye for sure, I think this upper lobe appears to be spared. It is involved there, but this appears to be spared. And what's really interesting about that is the fact that two days prior, he had pulmonary embolism demonstrated. And sure enough, intriguingly, he has pulmonary emboli confined to the right upper lobe. So of course, one can, and I like to speculate that he has diminished overall blood flow to the right upper lobe. So if I'm right about the pulmonary fat emboli, the fat emboli kind of didn't go up to the right upper lobe, at least not in the same volume because of the presence of pulmonary embolism and fine to the right upper lobe. So it kind of makes a, a big story. You may or may not be convinced, but what do you think? Oh, I agree, Howard. And you know, you, you bring up a very interesting point. And you know, it's funny, I haven't seen a case in a long time. And but in my experience, almost I think almost all the cases I've seen have always occurred after the OR. And, yeah. uh, and whether it's just a timing thing, or I think you're absolutely right when they're putting that rod in there. I mean, they're displacing a lot of fat, and, and I think the mechanism hasn't quite been worked out. Is there a change in pressure in the bone? Is it disruption of the normal blood vessels? But I've seen it usually post-op. Often in the PACU, they get hypoxic. And we'll see the, the the PACU radiograph. So I think the timing in your case is pretty reasonable. And I really like the. Uh, how many how many days after the trauma was the the surgery? Uh, the trauma was on the twenty fifth, and the nailing is on the twenty eighth. It's still not unreasonable that it could be you know, that. 48 to 72 hour window just from the trauma. I suppose it could be, but it's certainly intriguing that he had and developed symptoms just a few hours after placement of that rod. So we'll never know. Yeah. 
and it's but not I, severe. Yeah, but I like the upper lobe sparing. That's neat. It probably by the time what was the time frame between that CT and the radiograph? You said about three days, two days, two days. So probably at that point, maybe some more vasoconstriction up there. Yeah. I think the timing makes sense on this one for for the fat embolism. From what I've seen, uh, because we see at our at our county hospital, we see a lot of car accidents and um, fractured. We, even sometimes, even with, without the surgery, I've seen uh, fat embolism uh, syndrome, uh, and it's usually a, a few days, two two days maybe later, uh, or after the repairs. Yeah. So the mutus seems consistent based on the timing. Yeah, it's certainly intriguing and interesting case. Let me show you this next trauma case. So we see at this time a conventional thoracostomy tube, right fill space. We see an opacity here that is present. This opacity is large. It has convex margins internally. It may indeed have the so-called incomplete aura or tapering margin sign, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, he was imaged with CT on the first, but I'm going to skip forward a bit here to show you that on the fourth now, he still has the chest tube and the opacity, and they've put in an extra small caliber pleural space drainage tube presumably interpreting that as pleural fluid and not surprisingly as you'll see this new tube in the peripheral right hemithorax has not drained that because that is not intrapleural in location. I'll go forward in time here to the fourth so this is yep yeah, that's the same day in time and if we take a look at that we'll see here is the new pleural drainage catheter that's present. The chest tube as it turns out is in the interlobot fissure but this opacity here has features typical of an extra pleural hematoma and indeed in locations like here we can see the so-called displaced extra pleural fat sign of an extra pleural process. And this is a very attenuating hematoma. So a really nice extra pleural fat sign of an extra pleural process. And then not surprisingly, if you were only to see this, which is post-op, this new tube that you see here is actually very long and very soft. It's not a conventional chest tube. But here's an excerpt of the op report describing how they evacuated this extra pleural hematoma and placed this soft lake drain into the space occupied by the extra pleural hematoma. So most of the opacity now, of course, is gone. So initially misconceived or misinterpreted as a persistent pleural fluid collection, but it's an extra pleural fluid collection. So of course, going back to this, this is sort of epidural hematoma-like. It's convex internally. We have the tapering margin sign of an extra pleural process, not an intrapleural process. Sometimes, of course, the loculated pleural fluid collection can be difficult to distinguish, but a really nice case of extra pleural hematoma, which they drained. I'll show you. This is just a curiosity when I first saw this, I didn't know what these were. So those of you that see these operations where they do LVADs, but they also institute extracorporeal, like in this patient, extracorporeal right ventricular assistance. So not uncommonly after placement of an LVAD, the right ventricle may fail. And they may need to institute extracorporeal right ventricular assistance with a right atrial cannula and the cannula in the main pulmonary artery. I didn't know what these things were, these small devices right there. So that turns out to be, now we don't usually do a CT, but I 
use the CTE to show what that is. So for example, if I go to this and make, initially I'll make this one, move this over, a, um, a thick MIP image, we'll see that those things are so-called tourniquets that are put in to keep these cannuli in place. So they don't want them to slip out. And surgeons here, I don't know about surgeons in other places, but here they not uncommonly fix these in place using tourniquets that are designed for that purpose. So here's a, a skin image showing these little, or the opaque portions of the tourniquets that they use just to fix these to the anterior chest wall and skin to make sure they don't move in space. So if you ever see that, that's what that is. Howard, can you go back to the radiograph and mag it up a little bit? I want to see them again. Yeah. So we'll mag it up. So we have two yeah. here and we have one here. Okay. Just tubular, hollow tubular. Turns out to be opaque portions of tourniquets. We're not imaging the entirety of it, but the opaque portion looks like that. Yeah, I'll show, I've got quite a few, but I'll show one more, then I'll stop. This one is a nice example of multiple intrabronchial airway metastases from clear cell carcinoma of kidney. Last week I showed a solitary tracheal metastasis around intraluminal lesion that was removed. But here I'll show you in multiple locations. This is the largest of an intrabronchial metastasis with a post obstructive phenomenon in the adjacent upper lobe there. That's pathologically proven, as is the one here in the middle lobe, here also with a post obstructive phenomenon of accumulation of material in the lumens of airways. And here is another one right there, which I think is likely an intrabronchial metastasis as well. So just one form of metastatic disease, intrabronchial, intra-airway, maybe this pulmonary one too, from clear cell carcinoma of kidney. Okay, Jeff, those are mine for now. All right, thank you, Howard. So who would like to show cases next? David, do you have cases this week? I wanted to, but I didn't get time. I'm Understood. sorry. Peter or um, Brian? Sorry, I don't have any. That's okay. All right, well, I can show some. Okay, um, I'll start with this case. Uh, so this is a patient who had a heart transplant and I can't remember why the CT was done, um, but this is after the transplant. And uh, what, what was seen is this metal body here in the left lower lobe, right there. Very stellate looking, almost, but very dense. So clearly a piece of metal and um, unclear exactly where it is, whether it's in an airway or in a vessel. This is um, a pre-operative, I'm sorry, that's a post-operative. This was the pre-operative radiograph. And we don't see anything back there at that time. But you'll notice the patient does have um, an ICD uh, with a pacing lead and a left ventricular pacing lead. And there's the shock coil there. And this is a subsequent radiograph post-transplant. And if I mag it up, we can see that there is this little metallic body there on the left. And then on the lateral projection here, 
we see that indeed there it is. And if you look very closely at it, you'll see it looks like the tip of a pacing lead. Yeah. I think if I go back to the um, to this, I think it's the tip of the left ventricular lead. So that goes through the coronary sinus into a vein. Um, so what I'm thinking happened is they when they backed this out, the tip must have broken off and embolized into the lung, uh, probably at the time of transplant, and is now lodged in the left lower lobe. And I've, I've, I've not seen that before. We see retained, it's not uncommon to see a retained lead um, because they have to cut them, but this I've never seen an embolized tip like this. But that's what it looks like. Uh, I presume everyone would agree. Yeah, it sure looks like that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it looks it looks on the on the plane form you you showed that there might be two pieces of metal in that left base. Let me in the post op. Oh, that's a that's a, a nipple marker. I see. Yeah. Sorry, we do those routinely, so I don't even notice them half the time. All right, this is just a nice classic, but a really nice case with a nice uh, radiograph. So. Um, radiograph in a young person here, and we see what looks like a well-defined nodule in the right upper lobe. It's got nice round margin, seems to sort of almost be teardropped here. And then you'll notice there is relative lucency of the left, uh, the right upper lobe relative to the left. There's a paucity of vessels. The ones you do see are much smaller than those. And so um, in an asymptomatic patient, you'd worry about, um, I wouldn't worry, but you'd suspect they're um, either there's bolus disease here, but with a nodule like that, you wonder if there's an occluded bronchus. And on CT, you can see, let me load real quickly. But, so we can see there's the relative lucency in the right upper lobe. See the small vessels. And then you start seeing some tubular structures filled with secretions, and these are nice airways, so nice dilated bronchi filled with secretions. And then just normal lung, but very hypovascular, so um, maybe a few little cystic spaces in there, but a nice example of bronchial atresia. And if we go back to the um, bronchus here, we see the anterior and posterior segments of the right upper lobe, but there is no apical segment. So this is uh, bronchial atresia, the apical segment of the right upper lobe. Whether or not there's a component of CPAM in there, maybe, um, probably not enough for me to get excited about. Uh, I'd like to see more disorganized looking lung. So, bronchial atresia. Uh, this is another, just something, uh, kind of a nice example here. So, young patient comes in with chest pain and has this round mass. It looks like the uh, right upper lobe here, anterior segment. You see it along the fissure. And if you look very closely, you may make out a few air bronchograms in it suggesting that it may be consolidation. Young patients, so a neoplasm less likely, may be something inflammatory, a solitary like that. Could be GPA, but not very common disease, and solitary is uncommon. Could be uh, an unusual infection, like uh, around our part of the woods, uh, um, blastomycosis. Um, and so the patient got a CT scan the next day for PE. Uh, even though it really doesn't look like infarct at all. It's too rounded and not really subpleural enough. And uh, was found to have fever and all that later on. But um, Some big lymph nodes, but morphologically normal, um, may be reactive. But here's this uh, area of consolidation, much more ill-defined and a lot bigger than on the radiograph with some ground glass around it, sort of in a almost acinar distribution here, and then involved middle lobe as well. So good look for something infectious spilling into the airways. And this patient was treated with just uh, the usual course of antibiotics and got better. Nothing ever grew out, but it wasn't fungal or anything unusual. So a community acquired pneumonia, um, presumably uh, bacterial and presenting as a rounded pneumonia, round pneumonia, which uh, we always learn about as occurring in children, but I've seen actually more cases in adults than I have in children. Um, I think Dave has mentioned before, one of the things you might think about an immunocompromised patient is um, something like uh, different species of Legionella, and of course, Mucor can present as a rounded mass, um, but this patient was immune intact. So I really like, um, I like Legionella McDadii for a round pneumonia in an adult. Yes. And we're probably getting into air conditioning 
you know, season. So Legion and all is out there. Right. But isn't McDadii more opportunistic? I think the cases we've seen have always been in immunocompromised patients. Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. Maybe, maybe maybe that's the case. I don't know yeah. how this much. This was a healthy individual, so. Okay. But just a nice example. And then I showed a case a few weeks ago of um, veno-occlusive disease, pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, uh, in a young, in a teenager who ultimately got um, transplanted for that. This is a, an older patient with known uh, limited scleroderma or systemic sclerosis who presented with progressive shortness of breath. And you can see there's pleural effusion, there's septal lines, um, doesn't have fibrosis, has the an abnormal esophagus. And on the soft tissue windows, uh, you can see a small pericardial effusion, um, smallish left atrium. The pulmonary arteries are just a little bit big, but on a right heart cath had very elevated right heart pressures, pulmonary artery pressures, and a normal uh, wedge uh, pressure. So uh, all fitting with uh, pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, which can be a, um, a manifestation of systemic sclerosis and actually has a very poor prognosis. The patient wasn't a transplant candidate and wasn't really interested in pursuing further uh, treatment. There isn't a lot of options for it. Um, so went for a palliative care, but um, you can um, see this outside. It, it can, we often see isolated cases. This one is interesting. The, the septal thickening isn't as pronounced as I've seen in some cases, but it's there. And with the right heart cath data um, supporting the diagnosis, I think it's the CT and the right heart together are enough to confirm uh, at least a purported diagnosis of PVOD. But uh, be aware it does occur in scleroderma patients. I've seen it in quite a few. Sometimes they get central lobular nodules as well, um, but they usually have some signs of pulmonary hypertension, either on a, a CT or an echo, and then the right heart cath confirms the diagnosis. This person did have pulmonary hypertension? Yeah, right heart, uh, yeah, it had a right heart cath confirmed. Very high pressures. I don't remember exactly the numbers, but uh, severe. It is sometimes said, and I don't know why or what the pathophysiology is, is that in this context with pulmonary hypertension, if you also have pericardial fluid, that the pericardial fluid seems to portend a bad prognosis overall. But I'm not sure exactly why. Yeah, I, I, I've seen it in a lot of advanced PPOD cases. Yeah, that's usually just in pulmonary hypertension with connective tissue disease patients. So Jeff, mm -hmm. can we go back to your um, bronchial atresia case? Of course. Which is a, a lovely example. I thought so too. The, um, uh, you know, um, it, I found a, a few cases where I thought that might be the diagnosis, but it, there was actually a central obstructing tumor. In one case, you know, it was a benign, like interbronchial hamartoma. Uh -huh. You couldn't really see it separately. And another case, it was actually a small cell lung cancer. It was very small and it was intrabronchial. Oh. Uh, but it looked just like this. And um, so, you know, the patients that I've seen with this diagnosis of bronchial atresia that have gone to bronch, um, the bronchoscopic findings are no finding. Right. Because it turns out that the atresia occurs at the origin of that branch of the bronchus. So the occluded bronchus is actually occluded right at its, at its origin. And therefore, all the bronchoscopy sees is the other branch. The bronchoscope slides right by, you know, this um, this thing in the wall that was actually the the blocked origin. Uh, you know, I had assumed that that the blockage was somewhere down the lumen, so that you would encounter uh, a wall as you advance the bronchoscope. But actually, the finding is no finding. So the cases I've seen that have gone to bronch have no findings on bronchoscopy. So, um, you know. You need sometimes you need bronch to exclude a central obstructing lesion. In this situation, the bronchoscopist will not see the will not see right. that lesion. You've got the anterior segment, you've got the posterior segment right there, and you have absolutely no apical segment bronchus. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that's been my experience too, and that I think that is probably a failure of the of the foregut to bud or branch at that point, but there's right. long distal to it. Or, or it's there originally, and somehow it. Um, you wonder if it, if it, if it, if it can't um, sort of hollows out to form a bronchus over time, and it fails to do so. Yeah, I think that if I remember, this one had old imaging too that was reassuring. But you may you raise a good point: is not all uh, airway obstructions are benign, and 
Um, more often you can see something in the airway. So if you see a convexity in the airway, clearly there's a lesion in there, but this one doesn't even have an airway. So yeah, you're right, the bronchoscopist won't see anything. Okay, um, and let me show this case. This is one I sent to some of you because this is a curiosity and I have no idea <laughs> what it is. We can't, I don't think any of us can figure it out. It's a decent study too. So this was a PE study done in the ED and um, one of my residents actually picked this up and notice this funny vessel here passing behind the left inferior pulmonary vein. And if we follow it back up, it, you know, you think it might be a, a bronchial artery, it kind of makes this loop. Um, but here you see it in or against the wall, the esophagus, and it sort of disappears in there. It doesn't hook up to the bronchial arteries, which arise much higher off the aorta. And there's a bunch of variant anatomy described. And honestly, I never can remember it all because um, we don't really deal with it that much, but you can get a single trunk, you can get multiple trunks, but there's a bronchial artery. But what's abnormal is if we go down to the right lower lobe, and let me switch it to a lung window, and we'll see there's kind of a funny vessel in this area. Um, so that looks all fine down there, but as we go back towards the hilum, and I'll change the windows back, we'll see that there's sort of a tortuous little vessel that crosses. Slow. Yeah, this little guy right here. This little guy kind of snakes in there. So looks like it's trying, and if this hooks up, if we follow it back, you can actually follow it. Uh, comes off a, 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 a probably comes off a pulmonary artery. Change the window here. And then heads back. Yeah, so there's the pulmonary vein there. So that's the pulmonary vein right there if we follow that up and so that tortuous little vessel kind of snakes around back here so it's unclear if this is a pulmonary artery to bronchial vein fistula that goes towards that mediastinum right in there or where it goes or if it's a, it, it doesn't really look like a typical pulmonary avm we don't see a big draining vein because uh, these two vessels cross. So that's the artery, this is the vein, and they just cross each other. So unclear where exactly it goes. And, and so those, and Howard had made some nice reconstructions trying to figure out where this went, but I couldn't tease it out, but it was purely an incidental finding. So, I mean, there are all of these bronchial pulmonary artery shunts in the lungs. We sometimes see them um, explain some of the physiology we see, but I don't know. I don't. I don't know what this thing is, but let me make a nip here. Maybe that'll follow it on a little bit. But just a weird vessel passing here because usually that's where you often see the bronchial arteries. It'll pass through the lymph nodes and it'll run down there. But I, I wonder if this is sort of trying to be a bronchial vein, and it's unclear if it enters the left atrium or not. Yeah, couldn't figure it out ultimately. Yeah. But so there is. For those of you who took a look, thanks. I, I think it's purely incidental. It doesn't seem to be causing any physiology. He's not, he does, he's not cyanotic. He's not having embolic phenomena. He's not hypoxic, so it doesn't desat. So I think it's just probably some, it's probably a, um, it's either a left to right shunt, a small left to right shunt, or even a right to, it's probably a right to right shunt. So it's so small, it probably has no physiologic effect. But I don't know. So we, we do see these funny connections sometimes. We usually just don't see the bronchial veins because they're so tiny. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Um, and Howard, you said you had a few more. Peter, did you have any cases? I got one, Jeff. All right. Let's let's let you show your case, and then if Howard chooses to, he can share some more. My internet, my home internet's kind of slow, so I, I had a few more. Something. I'm not sure it's going. On. We'll see if it works. Could not transfer all my studies? But uh, you guys see the screen? Yep. Good. Okay. Okay. So this was a case shown to me by uh, my colleagues, uh, and uh, thought it was it was pretty interesting. Um, this is a uh, patient in his uh, early 40s, no significant past medical history, and this is a follow-up scan that we read recently, but. Um, he initially presented in 2017 with a spontaneous uh, left-sided pneumothorax, and he was admitted um, in um, uh, admitted by uh, 
thoracic surgery and he got a chest tube um, and uh, the, the pneumothorax was treated well. Uh, he also, it was thought to be uh, because of a ruptured uh, bulla on the left lung and he got a, uh, he got a thoracoscopic bullectomy also on the left side. And uh, you can see the little surgical suture there. Uh, the pathology was was uh, came back as uh, bullous emphysema, and um, and then uh, in twenty uh, uh, one year ago, he got a seminoma and and uh, he got an or or orchiectomy. So this scan is just a follow up looking for uh, metastatic disease from the seminoma, just for nodules, but. Um, when uh, my colleagues look at this one, and uh, they 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 this pattern of it looks like to me also I agree this looks kind of um, like these oblong cystic uh, structures here, thin walled cysts, and their base look predominant. So a question was brought up of whether this could be uh, Bird Hog Du Bay um, syndrome disease, and uh, um, so we were wondering, we were wondering what, what, how easy is it to, uh, or how easy is it to differentiate Berhag du Bay from uh, bullous emphysema on, and uh, on his pathology, and we pulled up a study, or a paper. Uh, and it seems like it's not, it's not that straightforward to differentiate it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, basically a differential diagnosis. Um, but the histo here's a, a key sentence in the abstract. The histologic findings are not specific for Bird Hog Du Bay. Um, and then it, it talks about how they're basal or predominant. And, um, and it seems like uh, a, a key, key players to make this. Uh, and then here again, um, so, So it seems like cysts and bulla are, and bullous emphysema are part of the differential. So it seems like a key key uh, part of making this distinction is the clinical history and then the radiographic uh, distribution uh, of the nodules. And then the other thing we were wondering is, could there be any connection with the uh, seminoma, those diagonal follow-up? That's not really one of the typical masses that you think about with bird hog du bay, but there has, we did find some mention in an article here uh, about how the uh, mutation, these germline mutations, which are associated with the uh, bird hog du bay, may also be have have uh, seminomas have been observed. Um, it was mentioned here somewhere. So I think these days they just do a genetic test. I mean, you can find right, and and no no and then yeah. So this has this patient hasn't been tested, but I was wondering. Uh, family history, family history is very important. It could be very helpful. Let me back here. What do you guys think about this for bird hog Is it just a mimic of? Yep, I think it's typical uh, of the yeah, The nice floppy cysts in the right distribution. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely typical. Yeah. Along septae and things like that, and veins. <clears throat> But um, yeah. family history is yeah. it's it's a dominant it's a dominant um, condition. So you know, family history is usually right. uh, present. And yeah. then look at his skin too. Yeah, and then uh, there wasn't much in the family. There wasn't much in the notes about the family. The other interesting thing that I forgot to bring up is that this patient uh, was never a smoker. Um, so the this was still called emphysema when it was initially diagnosed, but it was thought to be. Uh, they, they they attributed it to secondhand smoke because he had a family. I think as his mother was diagnosed with lung adenocarcinoma. So, but then we just we just found that kind of uh, strange. But uh, I didn't see any family history, relevant family history to support. Also, so and nothing in the kidneys, the parts that are visible. No, no, there was nothing in the kidneys, and he had a dedicated abdominal scan. Uh, it didn't really show anything in the kidneys, and I didn't really see anything in the uh, physical exam uh, about skin or fiber folliculomas, but uh, cool. Yeah. yeah, that is interesting.
And that's all I have for this week. I'll show a few more next week. Thanks. That was a great case. Yeah, we just had one. We just had one recently too, de novo, but it was in the setting of renal cell cancer for staging. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does anybody else have cases? Always end early. A few more just to okay. finish. I'll get yeah. control. There we go. Okay, I won't even give you any history here because I think you'll be able to tell what's going on just from the imaging findings. So I'll just scroll through it from bottom to top. So clearly a person with very extensive metastatic disease, um, even without the history, seeing that some of the larger opacities here have osseous and or chondroid matrix, one would think of an extremity chondrosarcoma or osteosarcoma metastatic. And initially he was described as having, I'm not quite sure why at this time, venous thrombosis, but very clearly when we look at these, those are clearly tumor. So there is tumor invasion from adjacent tumor into pulmonary veins. I think it's local invasion from contiguous tumor rather than growth of intravascular metastases as such. And of course the large veins are involved. So pretty extensive venous invasion um, is present large lesions. Um, there were a couple of places where I couldn't for sure tell between arteries and veins, but it really doesn't matter for sure. Certainly for a structure like that, at that size, it may be hard to distinguish between land embolism and tumor embolism. But this is probably the most dramatic case of, it's also nodal metastatic disease, of direct invasion of the inferior pulmonary veins by tumor. Rather extensive, unfortunately. Yeah, serious. What, what really, was the pathology type? What, what was it? Chondrosarcoma, David. Got it. Yeah, it's just just awful. This one is actually just normal anatomy, but I was asked about this and had to look at it a couple times and. Eventually, we decided that this seemed to be a pretty, and I'll put the, uh, let's say, the sagittal alongside this one. And then I'll go to the area of interest, which is just a small finding right here, which on the sagittal corresponds with that. So this, I think, is very typical for what some people might call a probe patent, PFO. So there's no contrast medium that seems to be going through there, but there is contrast medium here in relation to portions of ostium primum and secundum, but just a small probe patent PFO that we happen to catch there. I don't know if people describe that by other means, but I think it's pretty typical for that as a, of course, an incidental finding right there and there. Mm -hmm. So if we saw actual contrast coming out there, that would be contrast going through a PFO, so. Yeah, I think those are the ones that often open up if a patient develops enough elevated right heart pressure, usually from acute pulmonary embolism, you can sometimes see the contrast going across the defect at that point. Yeah, right there. Okay, good. So just some nice anatomy. Let's see what this one is. I'm trying to remember now. I've shown you the other ones. Hmm. 
Oh, okay. Um, this is a patient with uh, COVID pneumonia, and I want to show you, here we can see the pretty typical progression of a really severe form of it. So we go from the 9th to looking like this on the 23rd of June. The patient's pretty sick. And then um, intermittently got acutely ill, and they were looking for pulmonary embolism. And I'll show you now on the 25th that uh, we did find some small emboli. So for example here, and we certainly know about the prevalence of pulmonary embolism now in patients with the pneumonia. But what this one also shows, and let me bring up the earlier one for comparison, is that there is the development of a mild but generalized intrathoracic lymphadenopathy. So over this period of time, which is here two days, there is enlargement of mediastinal lymph nodes in multiple locations. There is some enlargement of hyalur, and then some intra, infrahyalur intrapulmonary lymph nodes, lymphoid tissue in the lung substance itself, subcarinal, more intrapulmonary regional lymph node enlargement. So certainly I think that I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of CTs, but I think that does occur and presumably some form of reactive lymphadenopathy, or maybe part of this is just wet lymph nodes, I don't know. But I do see that, I've seen two cases now. So I don't think that has to portend something different necessarily. in these patients. All right. Yep, I've shown you, I've shown you all mine. All right, well, thanks, Howard, for the extra cases this week. That sarcoma one, quite impressive. Yeah. All right, everyone, well, thank you. We'll end a little early today. I think people are pretty busy with the post-COVID, well, the, the, we're not post-COVID, but the rebound of clinical work. So I'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everyone. All right, bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good weekend.